Hey, folks, welcome back to the show. Uh, today's guest is a repeat guest, uh, Dr. Amy Killen. And uh, Dr. Killen has amazing information to share with us, um, plus a little tidbit on an oral peptide formulation that um, we don't actually talk about on the podcast, but I wanted to share with you guys um, for the end. So make sure that you check out the show notes for the link. And um, I'm going to describe a little bit of it in the intro. And uh, yeah, let's just um, let's just jump in. In this episode of the Biohacking Superhuman Performance Podcast with guest Dr. Amy Killen, we explore the world of stem cells, what they are, how they perform in the body, and how they work to increase longevity. Stem cell therapy is still being researched and regulated, but there's an amazing amount of potential for healing and increased longevity with these powerful cells. Like at the end of the day, if we're planning to live a lot longer, we're going to need powerful regenerative strategies so that we can live well. Now, we also dive into exosomes, the small molecules that can penetrate places that stem cells can't. We talk about aesthetic procedures that are popular with exosomes as they have the power to restore hair and rejuvenate skin and are used in many skincare products. We even go over ovarian rejuvenation and we talk about rapamycin, a potential prescription drug for delaying menopause. Overall, this episode offers guidance on stimulating stem cells right in your own home. We talk through different tips, such as supplements, fasting, getting sun in a healthy way for those who aren't in a place to budget for stem cell therapy at this time. Dr. Amy Killen is an outspoken advocate, and she's become a friend. She's Her personality is fantastic. She just sparkles um, for empowering people to look and feel their best by merging lifestyle modification, integrative medicine, body identical hormones or bioidentical hormones, energy modalities, as well as stem cell therapies. She's the founder and CEO of the Human Optimization Project, OP, H-O-P, a longevity-based subscription supplement company that stays on top of the science and constantly updates its ingredients for customers who cannot devote their lives to reading the latest research sourcing the best therapies. I'm going to be uh, trialing the Hope, Hop Box um, in the next little while and check it. make sure that you stay on top of my social media because I'll be posting about it there. I totally love her Instagram and you guys definitely need to check her out at Dr. Dot. Amy B. Killen on Instagram. Now, about that peptide um, formula, uh, Dr. Killen also is behind a novel BPC-157 oral formula called uh, Rapid Rebound, I think it is. Yep, called Rapid Rebound. And it's a really unique formula. They combine BPC-157 with PEA, as well as AOD9604. Now, some of you guys may know AOD9604 as a growth hormone secretagogue. In this instance, it um, it kind of stacks with the BPC and the BEA. And yes, it is orally bioavailable. So that's something to check out. If you want to check out this formula, you can go to levlabs.com, levlabs.com, and use discount code NAT20. And now let's jump into the episode. Hey folks, just a quick reminder that all of the information presented in this podcast is for information purposes only. No medical advice, no diagnosing, no treatments suggested here. Before you try anything that you hear about or learn about here, make sure that you check with your medical provider. Dr. Amy Killen, so excited to have you here today. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here, to be back here. Yeah, to be back. I mean, you were one of my first guests. I think I had you on the first year I had the podcast. Like, it was so long ago that I had to scroll and scroll and scroll. <laughs> I went, yeah, there she is. So anyway, it's uh, three years later. We, I know you a little bit better. And um, you've done amazing things. I mean, you were doing amazing things then. So now you're just next level amazing. And we were sitting here talking before the podcast about what we're going to talk about because your range is so, you've just got such a great range. And I love your Instagram channel, like the way you present information, you, there's you and there's another doctor, Carrie Jones. The two of you are honestly should, should your side hustle should be stand up comedy. But, <laughs> and, and it's I not. I, I think I just embarrassed myself more than anything. I don't think it's really that funny. But. No, you've got this like this beautiful way of articulating and communicating information that's accessible. And like lately, you've been, and we weren't going to talk about this, but I don't care. But lately, you've been really leaning into hormone replacement therapy. And because, I mean, I myself, I was just telling someone I was 
I was at a birthday dinner last week with a group of super smart, really well-educated, you know, close to 60 year old women. And all of them are paralyzed with fear when it comes to hormone replacement. And I'm just sitting there like you. Yeah. Like this. <sighs> Come that on. Gives me palpitation. That makes me so anxious to hear that. Right. Because I'm like, why? Like why? And you know, so they, they all think that you're, you're just, you're going to get cancer. And I'm, and, and so, I mean, we could spend 10 minutes talking this week. <laughs> and both for women. And it's funny because men have no problem with hormone replacement. I feel, I feel like men are like, just bring it, bring it on. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want it. Give it to me. And women are like, ah, yeah, no, I, I, I can't, I couldn't, I shouldn't. So do you want to, can I, hand you the desk and just let you have a little yes. baby hand. <laughs> um, I will just, I'll be brief, but you know, yeah. the reason I've spent so much time recently on Instagram is because of this reason. Like there's a lot, I talk about a lot of things in health, but there's very few things I talk about that I get such pushback on um, from other people. And that pushback is completely incorrect and ill-informed. Uh, and so this whole, this whole, the whole idea in the last 20 years, you know, from the women's health initiative, they, they came out with this misinformation and misinterpretation of data um, around the study. And it scared the pants off of women all over the world. You know, the number that just 20 million women or so were denied or taken off of HRT. And now 20 years later, there are so many people who still believe that misinformation, even though it's been disproven, it, you know, hormones do not cause cancer. They do not cause dementia or stroke or like all of these things. We know that like emphatically they don't. Um, and, and so, but people are still scared. Women are still scared, which is what, which is why I talk about it so much. Yeah. Well, and there's also this other group of people that are almost self-righteous about it and go, it's not natural. Exactly. So if it's not natural. Mother nature doesn't want us to have hormones. Therefore, why, who do you think you are replacing hormones? And my answer, which I think is similar to your answer is our expectations have changed. Yeah. We've raised the bar on mother nature. We've told we've said to mother nature, actually, we want to look really amazing and feel amazing and be performing amazing. Kind of like when we're 80 and 90. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, without any of these hormones on board, that's going to be hard. Yeah, I mean, we know that if you start hormones early, you know, early after menopause starts, um, closer to, you know, age 50 or whenever that is, that your overall mortality rate is about 30% lower than people who don't take hormones. And that's because of reduced cardiovascular disease risk, as well as um, osteoporosis risk and metabolic diseases like diabetes and things like that. And so, I mean, that alone, 30% reduction in all cause mortality, like what else gives you that? that doesn't really have any, you know, a lot of negative side effects. Like there's, there, there are no drugs that do that. You know, yeah. statins don't do that. Like there are all these drugs that we prescribe patients, which I'm not anti-drugs, but these hormones are actually very beneficial um, when used properly at the right time in the right way. And I think that, you know, women, yeah, people get nervous because they're like, yeah, well, we weren't supposed to take these things, but women also didn't live past 50, you know, like at 50, that's when menopause hits most people. And in the old, old days, you know, people weren't living that long, but now they are. And if you want to be healthy, then I don't know why you wouldn't at least look into these yeah. options. And so let me ask you one last question before we leave this topic, because we are really, this is not what this whole podcast is about. <laughs> but are there unicorns out there? Are there women who, without hormone therapy, seem to do, move through this transition and do really well on the other side of it? Like, is there such a, is there a, even if it's small, is there a population of women that seems to do fine without it? And how are they getting away with that? <laughs> do we know? I know. There are absolutely women who to you know, go through menopause. They don't have a lot of symptoms. They're not that uncomfortable. They feel fine, um, and they, you know, they may live to be a hundred years old. Um, and so, it's. I don't think we can say hormones will make you live forever. Yeah. But we know that when we look at population data, when we look at disease, you know, specific diseases like diabetes and obesity and and you know heart disease and some of these major killers of women that when you start hormones, especially estrogen early, you're reducing your risk of getting those diseases um, and developing the problems that come with them. So I don't, you know, everyone has their own, um, their own biases, but I just think if women were informed mm -hmm. uh, and not with not scared, then they yeah. could make a decision about what's right for them. Yeah. I think if we could, if we could only even just remove the fear factor and just bring it to an in pure information, then I think we'd be in yeah. better shape. Okay. So now we get to pivot. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> because we're going to talk about one of your other passions. And I think it's the, the first thing I heard you speak about ever, I think was stem cells because you were working in a, and you might still be working in this clinic with, with, right. Um, yeah. Doing all kinds of cool stem cell procedures. And this one goes back a few years now. Um, and we decided we were going to explore this kind this world of stem cells and exosomes because exosomes is, I'm not going to say it's the new darling, but definitely there's a lot more chatter about it. Maybe it's just bubbling into the mainstream in a different way than it was before. Cause I know for you guys, you've known about them for a long time. So maybe let's do a little primer on stem cells and exosomes, what they are, that kind of thing. And then let's get into some of the use case scenarios or things that people should think about when they're thinking about it. Uh, yeah. I mean, we've been doing, I mean, I've been doing stem cells now for about 10 years and I wasn't even one of the earliest adopters. And then exosomes probably six or seven, like we were pretty, we were probably pretty early adopters of those, but so stem cells, you know, you have stem cells all over your body. There's all different types in your tissues. They are the cells that are responsible for the general upkeep of your organs and your tissues. Um, so they can do two main things. They can replicate themselves and they can differentiate or kind of turn into other types of cells down that same cell line. And so you, you have a, you know, a, a group of stem cells that are always there so that if you, you know, you cut your arm um, or you get bitten by a dog on your butt like I did two weeks ago, then no. you're still yeah, it's a whole story. But then your stem cells that are, live in that area will send out signals, you know, to the cells around them, and they'll say, "Hey, we got to repair this dog bite. We got to increase blood flow. We got to decrease inflammation. We got to bring in the immune cells." You know, it sends all these signals, um, and then it can also turn into other types of cells. So what happens as we age is that you have fewer stem cells. And the stem cells you have are less active. They're less able to signal repair. So like this stupid dog bite is taking me like weeks to repair, even though I'm doing all the things um, because I just have, you know, I've got 48 year old stem cells and not 28 year old stem cells. So the idea behind stem cell therapy is, can we give you back stem cells either from yourself or from somewhere else? Or can we give you some of those signaling molecules that the stem cells would release in order to get your body to heal itself better and faster? Right. Um, okay. So you mentioned, so there's different types of stem cells. So when people, when people are talk about doing stem cell therapy, and now you'll have to help me out here because I don't know what's cool and what's not cool in North America. We have, there's different rules and people sometimes will go to other countries to have certain types of therapies, but we have, autologous stem cells. So these are our own stem cells that can be taken out of either our fat tissue or bone marrow um, and then reapplied to the body. And then there are, I can't remember the, uh, the allogeneic. name. Allogeneic. And those would be from somewhere else. So usually from some kind of, um, I'm going to say from, from like a um, not that I'm thinking Wharton's jelly, but like stem cells from like a birth tissue product. So it could be Wharton's yeah. jelly, placental, umbilical cord, like basically the, yeah, the birth tissue. Right. So, so there's those two populate, those kind of two groups. And I would, mm -hmm. I would think that they have different applications. And I know that with the ones that are coming from birth tissue, there've been issues over the years with providers and stuff like that, but they typically are seen as, well, I mean, they're, they're brand new baby stem cells. So in many ways, they they haven't been, they haven't lived your life with you kind of as your autologous would. So maybe. Right. Yeah. I mean, so those, those two different groups of cells uh, that we just, that you just mentioned, those still fall under the umbrella of these, these mesenchymal stem cells, or some people call them um, mesenchymal signaling cells. There's some debate whether they're actual stem cells. It doesn't actually matter, but the idea is because they work the way they work is what matters. Um, so those are the cells that we use in practice. Um, there are other types of stem cells that we don't use, like for instance, embryonic stem cells, which you probably heard about like in the like 80s and 90s. Um, you know, those are actually coming from embryos and that's where a lot of the ethical concerns come in and they're also illegal to use in, in a clinical practice. So some people get nervous when we talk about stem cells or birth tissue, but we're not, you know, these no, no, no babies or fetuses or nothing is being harmed or touched by any of the, the therapies that we're doing. Um, with the cells we're using are all, they would go in the trash if they weren't donated to, to the lab. So right. we don't use embryonic cells. And then there are some other types of cells um, that are, you know, that are being investigated, like induced pluripotent stem cells, where they're actually taking cells.
cells and making them act like more youthful cells using te lab techniques. And there's a lot of research using those kinds of cells, but these MSCs, which are the ones that we use, are very safe, very well studied in terms of um, they don't cause cancer. They don't, you know, there's, there's the safety profile is very, very good, which is why we use them in clinic. Right. And so are different types better for different types of procedures? So now we've got different kinds of procedures, right? We have joint regeneration, which is a big market in and of itself. Like lots of people are wearing out their knees and their hips and their whatnot. Um, we've got procedures that are more aesthetic, um, which is really interesting, right? So maybe instead of getting a facelift, what we're doing is we're having stem cells injected into our faces so that we're bringing youthfulness back without right. the risk of looking kind of funny, um, which is starting to happen a lot in the world. <laughs> no judgment. No, ju I'm not judging. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> It's a slip and slope and we keep, you know, it's it anyway, that's a complicated thing. And then there's there's this this whole IV application where systemically we're reintroducing stem cells into the circulation based on the premise that, you know, when stem cells will be attracted by signal different types of signaling molecules and chemical messengers to areas that need attention. And so then we're just kind of sitting there going, okay, you just, you go do things. Go do your thing. <laughs> yes. So the short answer to your question is we don't actually know what types of cells are best for what, you know, for specific applications. I mean, maybe there are, there are studies in specific things like maybe knee pain, but there's really two schools of like, you'll go to organize, like there's meetings for the birth tissue product people and there's yeah. meetings for the stem cells from fat people and there's meetings for the bone like these are like actual organizations like actual like conferences you can go to so people have a lot of very very degree you know it, different opinions the people who are and by the way i've used all of these uh different types of products we we did Currently, we're using mostly um, birth products, like placental products in our procedures because we've seen really good results and it's a lot easier on the patient than having to get the stem cells from the patient. So that's what we are doing currently. But for the previous, you know, eight or nine years, we use all um, autologous. So we are all, you know, bone marrow and fat from the patient. So I have experience with both of these, um, but there's not a lot of like head-to-head -head clinical studies. You know, there's studies using the different types, but they're not head-to-head -head studies. So we don't know for sure, but the pros of the umbilical products are like the placental umbilical Wharton's jelly, all the things that come when you have, have a C-section baby and you deliver those products to the lab. The pros of those are more youthful cells and the higher ability to signal. So they are able to release more of the exosomes and other um, extracellular vesicles, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So that signaling is important. Um, the, the downsides of that is that you're getting someone else's, you know, cells, um, stem cells, the types of stem cells we use are not like, um, like other types of like blood stem cells. They don't have, they don't create, um, an immune response in your body right away. So it's not like, you know, with a blood transfusion, for instance, you can't give you know, mm. the wrong type of blood to someone or you'll have a reaction or you can't give the, you can't give an organ to someone that's not type and crossed to match you or they'll have a reaction, right? right. Um, with these mesenchymal stem cells, they don't have that same reaction. So you can take the mesenchymal stem cells from a placenta and you clean them and screen them and make sure they're very safe and you can give them to any person without having to match them. Right. They you can like blood them. where if it's not matched, you yeah. die. <laughs> exactly. So you don't have that re reaction. Um, they, they're kind of what we call immune privilege, which means the immune system doesn't see them. So yeah. they're kind of hidden when they get in there. But the immune system does eventually find them. And so that's something they, they do get cleared out eventually when that's one of the knocks against the umbilical cord cells is maybe um, maybe they're not as good because your immune system will eventually clear them um, versus if it was your own cells, you know, if they wouldn't. On the other side of that, the way that stem cells really work, and this is getting a little complicated, but I'm trying to go, I'll try to go slow, but the way they really work is like, if I take stem cells from like your fat, for instance, and I put those stem cells in your face, then those stem cells from your fat don't turn into skin stem cells. They don't graft in the tissue. So they don't become a different type of tissue. They can do that in the lab, but they don't do that in people. So what they do do is they signal the stem cells that are already in your face to increase your collagen and increase your hyaluronic acid and increase your blood flow and you know essentially like all the things you want right 
So they, they signal and then, you know, then they eventually get moved and swept up and carried away. So it, we, it may not matter that your immune system ends up clearing out those, you know, placental or umbilical cord cells yeah. after weeks or months because they've already done their signaling. So yeah. that's kind of, that's kind of the other side of that coin. Kind of like you need the painter to stay in your house and definitely he comes in, he paints and then he leaves. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, you know, there's some people who definitely think that the autologous route is the way to go because it's your own body. It's your own cells. They already know what to do. You know, it's like perf perfectly in sync with your body. So I, I think that they're, you, either one is great. The one, if you're using your own cells, is they are more invasive. And certainly if you're older or if you're sicker, then your cells are not going to be as good, unfortunately. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Um, what, how important it is, is it what's going on in the body when you introduce stem cells um like i i think at some point i was i was i don't know if i was talking to someone or but th the point was made that if you're like let's say for a knee because like, i talked to like you know you talk to two populations of people you talk to people for whom stem cells were transformative um mm -hmm. in a in a joint let's say for example um and then you talk to other people who are like oh yeah i got an injection in my knee it didn't do anything and sometimes you look at that person and you kind of go, hmm, I can kind of see it because, you know, like because they've had a knee injury for a very long time, let's say they've been more sedentary. Maybe they haven't watched their diet as well. So they've put on a bunch of weight and we know that with excess weight comes inflammation. Plus the joint itself is very inflamed because there's all this pressure on it. And so you know, like the question is, if we introduce stem cells, even stem cells into that environment, are they just going to kind of get burned up or are they able to overcome all of the issues in the environment? So it's a, it's a great question. And I, you know, absolutely the environment affects the stem cell. In fact, you know, where you put the stem cell in your body is affected. You know, the way the stem cell works is affected directly by the environment where you put it, right? Like if you put your stem cells, if you take a stem cell from your fat, you put it in your face, it's going to do different things than it would if you put that same stem cell in your, you know, in your knee or whatever. Like it, it has the signaling that it actually releases changes depending on that micro environment where you put it. That's so it's cool. Amazing. And That's so, so, cool. so yeah. it makes sense that if that environment, that micro environment, whatever that is, which is your body, if it is not healthy, if it is inflamed, you know, if you're a smoker, if you are an un you have diabetes and you have uncontrolled, you know, blood sugar, if you have, you know, if there's all these things uh, and that environment is not healthy, then those cells cannot work as well. And so like when we see patients, we are pretty strict with screening. Like I won't, if you're, if you're a smoker, I won't treat you with stem cells. Mm -hmm. And not that I don't like you, I have, I feel for you, but you need to stop smoking before you're going to have benefit um, from my procedures. And mm -hmm. because we know that smoking impairs your healing, you know, and all that same thing with, if you're, you know, if you're poorly controlled diabetic, it's the same thing. Um, so it, I think it's definitely, if you want to have the best results, take the time to get yourself in the best shape you can before, you know, a stem cell procedure, because these things aren't inexpensive. These are, you know, relatively costly procedures and you don't want to just throw your money down the hole. Yeah. So then there'd be value in saying, okay, you know what, let's take, call it three months or depending on the person, three months or six months to kind of get you ready for the procedure and improve your baseline right out of the gate. Um, I mean, ideally, obviously there's some patients who, you know, have more, have really would like to get treated and, and then, you know, you can still have good results, even if you're not perfectly ready. But I think if you're able to, uh, to get yourself more ready and, ha you know, have the, maybe a couple of the right supplements, a couple of the right, and obviously the right lifestyle and just kind of get yourself tuned up, then I do think you'll have a better result. Yeah. So what about on a systemic level? Because people who get stem cells by IV, the, you know, the, the belief or the or the or the hope is that it's going to help with kind of more amorphous things right it's going to help with the immune system or it's going to help with inflammation or which is the immune system probably immune system is just going to keep coming up so <laughs> <laughs> but maybe let's talk about that like the whole because yeah. there's lots of people that are like oh yeah i get an iv of like 20 million or 20 billion or whatever the units are these days of stem cells yeah, we, the, we, stem cells have this interesting property. Um, they have the ability to home, um, home in on areas of concern, essentially. So it's almost like when you're, you know, if you're, if you give stem cells in um, an IV, 
a lot of them will, the actual, if you get stem cells, a lot of them will get trapped in the lungs because the stem cells are kind of big. So a lot of them actually just get trapped in the lungs, but exosomes are a little different, but some of them still make their way to other places. And they, they have this weird ability to like, you know, like they're almost like, they're like being guided to different, the part of your body that is, you know, inflamed or irritated or like crying out for help. Um, so it can respond, they can respond to these signals in a very, in a very interesting way and make their way there. So that's the idea behind being able to give them, you know, potentially for more systemic diseases, you know, maybe you have some kind of brain disease or you have, you know, like other things where you can get them IV. Now we, we do some IV cells when, with our procedures. We don't tend to do them just as standalones only because we're being very specific about not treating systemic diseases because we don't want to get in trouble with the FDA. But there are a lot of people who will take stem cells, you know, use stem cells and trying to improve various diseases, you know, multiple sclerosis or, or Parkinson's disease or, you know, things like that. Um, there's a bunch of them out there. And then there's also people who are using stem cells just for like longevity purposes. And I think that that is an interesting, um, you know, it's interesting. We don't have a ton of data on it. I think it's more theoretical than, um, than, than real, but it's also not dangerous. There have been a couple of studies looking at older people and giving um, IV umbilical cord stem cells, and they saw improvements in frailty markers. So they were able to walk further in six minutes. They were able, you know, they looked at all these like tests of of frailty, and they were they saw improvements in several of those those uh, indices. But we just don't have like a lot of studies that look at large groups of people you know, for long periods of time to see how that can maybe how these stem cells or exosomes might change. But I'm optimistic that they probably help, at least yeah. for a lot of people. I mean, it would be hard to imagine that they don't. And so are there concurrent other therapies that are helpful to stack with the stem cells? So things like hyperbaric oxygen, let's say, or red light and near infrared light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so anything that increases nitric oxide is going to be great because nitric oxide and stem cells are like little best friends. Nitric oxide will increase stem cell activity and make them work better. So that can be red light therapy. That could be, um, you know, red, nitric oxide supplements like the NO2U, Nathan Bryan's company, um, which we're a big fan of. We give that to our patients. Um, you know, all those kinds of things where you're increasing nitric oxide, exercising, you know, all of that can help. Um, and then hyperbaric oxygen, absolutely. It's known to, uh, to increase stem cell proliferation as well. So you could do that, you know, like after a treatment or, or before either way, but we, we don't have it in our clinic, but we definitely are big fans of hyperbaric oxygen also. Um, and, and then red light therapy outside of nitric oxide also has other qualities and just by itself light, you know, different, different spectrums of light, um, especially the red and near infrared, uh, can increase the way this, the way the stem cells behave. It can affect their ability to move. It can affect their ability to release growth factors. Um, so like for a lot of my cosmetic procedures, you know, I recommend red light therapy in general, but especially after stem cell injections in the face or the hair or places like that, or even the, the vagina, I do a red light therapy home device. Uh, mm -hmm. for my patients after I do the vaginal injections, just for that reason. The Joy Lux? Yep. yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, that thing. Mm -hmm. I love that device. It's so nice. Well, it's nice for people to be able to take something home, right? And and do a follow-up and, yeah. and yeah, exactly. trying to aim your panel in the right place because it's just... <laughs> <laughs> that could be right there. <laughs> it's just not convenient. So, so you mentioned something about the FDA. So, in terms of what stem cells are are you know are on the map for for the FDA, like what they approve in, I'm going to say the U.S. because I don't. I'm guessing the rules maybe in Canada might be a bit different. So we're not going to even pretend to go there. Um, but in the U.S. Because I know there's been a lot of turmoil in the stem cell space over the years. There was a big, big lawsuit because of, I think there was one clinic where things went horribly wrong um, with a procedure for eyes that that didn't end well. Um, but in general, where it seems like the, the landscape's a little calmer. And is it because everybody kind of has a clearer understanding of the rules? Has the FDA loosened up a little bit? Or we're just kind of at, a, at an uneasy kind of truce at the moment? Yeah, the FDA, well, if you, if the FDA considers all stem cells, including cell, cells that come from your body, to be drugs. And they consider that if I take stem cells out of your body and I put the same cells back in your body, that it that if they somehow they turned into a drug after leaving your body before going back into your body. 
And they think that they have the, that they should then regulate that drug, um, which means essentially make you go through, you know, $2 billion worth of drug development uh, uh, before that has been proven safe to go back in your body. So if you ask the FDA, um, you know, they are, they think that they have a, a lot of of, uh, there's a lot of drugs out there that they believe yeah. that they should regulate. Now, bone marrow stem cell treatments have been used for decades in medicine. You know, that's something that has been used to treat a lot of like uh, blood cancers and things like that. So the use of bone marrow stem cells is is not an, a really an issue too much because that's been used for such a long time. And in medicine, we have what's called the practice of medicine, which means that, you know, for medical procedures, doctors can do the procedures as long as there's, a, you know, as long as there's some scientific information that says it's a good, you know, that's safe and it's not going to hurt someone. So that, you know, you can take, you can take the intestines and you can move them and you can create a bladder out of the, you know, you can make a different organ out of your intest intestines and that's okay. It's the practice of medicine. So that bone marrow stem cells was kind of regulated like that um, by the FDA. Like it's not really a drug. It's the, the bone marrow derived stem yeah, cells. Yeah, but adipose was not. It's no, no. But so <laughs> adipose, what, so, so, adip, so bone marrow was first. And then later on, we started doing adipose uh, where you take out fat. Now, when you do the fat, you have to get rid of the actual fat cells and just mm -hmm. keep the stem cells, right? And so to do that, there's a few different ways. One of them is you, do, you dissolve the fat um, in like a collagenase. And one of them is you just shake it up really good and you get rid of the fat wet that way. But, but you're just putting the cells back in. But what the FDA said is that the cells, when you shake up the fat or you give a collagenase, you're, they think that you're changing that tissue at such, to such a degree that it's no longer the same tissue. It's no longer, so you're they think you've changed the cells and therefore it's a drug. So that was the case that went before the, um, the that was Sean Berman and Cell Surgical Network's case. The, the, the FDA came after them for using fat derived stem cells. They fought it for several years and, uh, and Sean Berman and that group actually ended up winning against the FDA where exactly. the judge says, you know, this is, these are just the same cells. They came out, you took out the fat cells, but you put the cells back in, you didn't change them up. Those are still just your cells that falls under the practice of medicine and doctors are allowed to do that. So that's what happened. Um, it was, you know, a year or so ago that verdict came out, but, you know, unfortunately there's still a lot of people that the FDA hasn't officially changed their stance, but mm -hmm. with that, you know, with that ruling, we never stopped using fat derived cells because we always felt like this was completely safe and very much within our purview. But um, a lot of doctors, I think became a little more comfortable with using those tissues since that last ruling. Okay. Now, the other side of that is the birth products. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting landscape in that the these tissue products, so these birth products are, do are donated tissues from a C-section, healthy C-section deliveries. The mother makes the, you know, donates the tissue to the lab and it's the umbilical cord, it's the placenta. So it's all of these different things and you can make different types of products depending on the tissue. It doesn't really matter. They're all similar, but um, it's all donated. You, you know, it's all screened for diseases and all that. Um, so we've had, you know, the labs have been able to make these placental derived Wharton's jelly and products like that for, you know, for a long time. And as long as the lab itself meets the tissue, you know, the banking requirements, it's been fine. The problem it really gets down to if you use those kinds of tissues and then you make claims about the use of those tissues. So the FDA doesn't love that you use the tissues, but what they really don't like is if I take these birth tissues, like a placental product of some sort, and I say to you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cure your Alzheimer's disease with this product. Mm. Or I'm going to, you know, I'm gonna fix if, if I can't tell, I can't say I'm gonna fix anything on your body with these products, or then I've made claims, and that's very much against the rules. So there's still debate as far as how much of these products we can use and whether we should be using them at all. The FDA would say no, but many doctors still use them. But you, what you definitely can't do is make claims about it. Right. Okay. okay. <laughs> I just talked for so long. I'm sorry. No, that was great. I just... Um, Listeners, come back. Come back. I won't talk no, as much. No, they're with you. They're all sitting there going, okay, really? Uh, okay, fine. They all went for coffee. They're going to come back and come back. Come back. Yeah, they're all good. Um... So in terms of, like you mentioned multiple sclerosis earlier, can we talk about that? Like things like MS, like is there, 
is there, I mean, there's got to be, there's got to be some research going on around MS and neurodegenerative diseases. Like, can we talk a little bit about what the research is, seems to be showing now in terms of what's promising and what's not really panning out? Yeah, I mean, it's not my area of expertise, but I definitely know. I mean, certainly down in um, down in Panama, Panama, Dr. Neil Riordan's lab uh, yeah. does has been quite a bit of. They use umbilical and placental birth products, and then they what they do, what they what they do, and we can't do in the U.S. is they take these umbilical cord cells and then they expand them in the lab, meaning they let, they let them grow and replicate. And so you you turn you you start out with. 10 billion cell or 10 million cells. And then all of a sudden you've got hundred million cells because they're just growing and growing and growing. Well, and then they give the, that whole group to the patient. And so you're getting these very high volume um, infusions. We're not allowed to do that in the US. So that is one difference between us and like Mexico and Panama and Costa Rica and places like that. Um, but they are treating um, multiple sclerosis. They've, I mean, I've, I've talked to him about that and certainly he's mentioned I'm having some good results, but I haven't, you know, there's, there's always stories and anecdotes. It's, but the question is like, what is it? Like, what's the, what's the research actually yeah. showing? Is it like, can you just keep doing it over and over again in different people and getting the same result? And yeah, exactly. do that. It's, yeah. it's a tough one. Okay. Let's, let's talk about exosomes. Cause we said we were going to talk about exosomes and we, you've mentioned them a bunch of times and definitely People are all about the exosomes these days. There were exosomes flying around at if at the conference we were just at. <laughs> I, know. I had one guy at this last at one of the conferences recently. I don't even know who it was, but I wouldn't say anybody yet. But no. he wanted to put he wanted to shoot exosomes in a needle up the through the top of the nose, through the cribriform plate, which is like the top of the nose, up like up near the into the brain, essentially not into the brain, but like right next to it, like through the sinuses. Like he was at the conference with them in his pocket, being like, "Who wants to do this?" For me? <laughs> I, this was at like, I was just like a few months ago, but and someone was asking me like, "Should I let them do this?" And I was like, no, "You should not let them do this." Like, who, who is this person? Um, yeah. It so the point amazing, is, they are amazing. everywhere. I am going to say it is amazing to me, like. God love biohackers, like these self-designated people who will, it's like the, it's like this, this kind of like weird modern day equivalent of people who will throw themselves off buildings with a kite on their back and hope that they land well. Like, mm -hmm. it, it is amazing to me how far people will push it. But, you know, I kind of sit there and go, so you only have one body. I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, you know, I, I'm fairly like, I'm, I, I like to try new things and I think it's fun, but you do have to, you do have to like realize that there's, you can go too far for sure. And and when you do, it can be problematic. So don't inject things into your cribriform plate no. in your nose. No. Um, okay. So, so, so they, may, they may not go anywhere either. Like that's the other thing. So let's talk not. about exosomes. <laughs> yeah. So uh, stem cells, one of the ways that they, that they uh, end up sending their signals to the areas around them is that they release these little tiny, what like messenger bubbles. I think of them like little baby bubbles of information. And within those bubbles, those bubbles are called extracellular vesicles or EVs. That's kind of like the blanket term. And then exosomes are just a type of, you know, a specific size of extracellular vesicle. And, you know, EVs are the ones we, uh, that's the whole group term. The exosomes have within them things like, um, like growth factors and cytokines and messenger RNA, um, you know, little pieces of information, but it's not a whole cell. Like it's a little, like, little tiny thing. And then those exosomes kind of float around and then they get taken in by the cells around them. And then they kind of get swallowed up and then the exosomes can change the behavior of the cell that takes them in. Hmm. So it's, it's, it's very cool. And, and that is how, so exosomes are essentially like the signaling molecule of stem cells, or they're one of the signaling molecules. And so the, 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 what's good about exosomes is they're very, very small and they're not a full, like alive cells. So it gives us a lot more opportunity to use them uh, than having to have like a live stem cell, which is very hard to keep alive, you know, as you're trying to use them for different things. Um, exosomes are small enough to, to go through your skin. So you can actually apply exosomes to your skin and they will eventually get absorbed. I and mean, it can take like 18 hours, but they'll eventually make it through those top layers of skin, whereas stem cells would not. Um, their exosomes are small enough to get through the blood brain barrier. So if mm -hmm. you give them in an IV, they can get up to your brain. So like, you know, a lot of the people who are doing 
research on um, brain diseases like like Parkinson's disease or uh, traumatic brain injury or things like that, they're looking at exosomes because you can get through that brain, the blood brain barrier without having to do anything to the person to get them up there. And stem cells won't, right? They're too big. Stem cells won't unless the blood brain barrier has been disrupted. So if you have an acute injury to your brain, like if you have a traumatic brain injury, you're playing football, you get knocked in the brain, um, that blood brain barrier is inflamed. And when that happens, you get like an opening, you know, like it becomes like anywhere else. Like it's like the integrity of the barrier is disrupted for a period of time. And so that would still potentially let the stem cells in if you gave them an IV. But, um, but later on, you could always give exosomes because the exosomes are always small enough to get up there. Right. So what have you seen with exosomes in terms of the benefits? Like, you know, if somebody's listening to this and says, oh, that sounds interesting, but who should, who should think about exosomes as that we know I mean, of at this point? The like most common say. things we use them, the most common things that you'll find them used for is aesthetic purposes. So like, like hair restoration and skin rejuvenation, because Technically, according to the FDA, we're not supposed to put exosomes inside the body. Okay. So the FDA says you can only put them on the outside of the body. So like you can apply them to your skin, essentially. Like you, what if you skin. microneedle first? <laughs> Does that count? Uh, I mean, I don't, I don't think, I think, it, I think it's fine. I, yeah, I've been using them for years, microneedling, but um, I mean, I don't, if you ask the FDA, I don't know, but I know that they say topical exosomes are what they think is okay. Everything else you have, they have to go through the FD for that, for the drug regulation pathway. Um, so we, you see a lot of them uh, being applied in aesthetics. You um, you'll see them in skincare products. There's so more and more. Live? So, cause, cause I, what I've seen of exosomes, it seems to me like, People seem to think they need to be kept at minus 80 degrees, like really super frozen, and then thawed right before use. Yeah. Otherwise, they become useless. And yet, I was actually going to ask you about this. When we see skincare that says it has exosomes or stem cells in it or whatever, whatever the language is, my understanding is certainly stem cells have to be kept super frozen, like minus 80, yeah. I believe, is the... Is the temperature? Yeah, I mean, for sure, uh, skincare products do not have stem cells in them, um, if, if, or they have dead stem cells. I mean, yes, they could have dead cells in there, but they're not alive in any skincare product. Exosomes, uh, the same thing. They're not really alive, but they're. You could still have an intact exosome that mm -hmm. still has the messaging inside of it. And it's not going to be as potent for sure as if you get it right out of the freezer and defrost it like we do in, a, in the clinic where we use for facials and things like that. Um, but there's the, I think that there's the potential for still having some activity that, you know, you still have some of the protein activity and some of the um, potentially some of the messenger RNA activity, but yeah, it's not going to be as strong, uh, but I know it's a, it's a big avenue of research in the, in the um, skin world in the last five years or so is looking at how can we get these exosomes into skincare products to keep them intact, get them through the skin, and then be able to deliver those messages, you know, to your skin to help rejuvenate. Right. Because I guess part of it is how deep, what layer of skin are you going to get to, to affect that change? Because I think that's where, we get all crossed up, right? We spend all this money slathering all these amazing things on our skin. But I can tell you from where I'm sitting, <laughs> you know, on the just having hit my 60th birthday, you know, it's I'm not like the my actual skin looks fine. It's what's happening under the skin. The support right. system is what's starting to. Yes. And these they're tell me. <laughs> really even stem cells even when you inject them even exosomes none of them are great for renewing the structures underneath the skin um, they're really much better for skin so you could yeah, we could we use them we can inject them or put them topically and you can help the skin look healthier um, but you're not you're not building up the fat you know the fat pads that you lose with age um, with age the bones also start to like you absorb you know the bones around your eyes your orbital rims get bigger like everything is like it's like your body is like, <laughs> like, <laughs> you're killing not, me <laughs> not you i mean it's me too it's all of us but it's you know but unfortunately that all and the system cells don't necessarily stop that from happening um and certainly you're not going to give you back as much volume as like fillers or things like that but they are great for the skin itself for wound healing you know things like that yeah so in terms of regenerative stuff like in terms of 
because there's I I sp- I interviewed someone else yesterday who is doing facial rejuvenation that is not he's not using fillers he's not cutting um, he's doing things like and I don't know if this is your area of of genius or not I mean you have so many so you would be <laughs> forgiven if this wasn't one of them um, but he's doing things like fat transfer which is interesting because in as we're talking about fat you know and we. You know, t- people will think of fat as blubber, blech, useless, don't need it. What does it do anyway? It just looks nasty. But if you think about, really think about fat, it's really a very sophisticated tissue. Like it, it is hormonally active. It's metabolically active. It it has, it's full of stem cells. And so he was talking a little, he was kind of talking about doing fat and he's not the only one I've seen people doing fat transfers into the face. And he was actually, he actually uses it even for breast reconstruction. Um yeah. So yeah. is that really because, the only avenue for readdressing that kind of infrastructure a little bit? I mean, if you want to be if you want to be natural and you don't want to do a facelift, yeah, um, then fat transfer is probably the best thing. You can use something like PRF, which is platelet rich fibrin matrix. So it's like PRP, which you know you just get your blood, you spin it, you get the platelets. You take that and you essentially can make it a little thicker, and so it's yeah. more like a gel than it is like a liquid. And so you know there's some evidence that that may stick around longer, and maybe it's a little bit better at you know getting keeping the volume there versus PRP, which doesn't really help the volume that much. Uh, fat transfers are, we're, I don't do them myself, but I have in the past. Um, you know, we've gotten a lot better at them. It used to be that you, when you put fat somewhere, only like half of it ended up staying like yeah. over the course of like, you know, you'd look great. <laughs> and you're like, Oh my gosh, it's beautiful. And then like, you know, two months later, like your face looks like it, you know, it's like kind of fallen back as it, as it was before. So it's not horrible, but like you, you it go, it wouldn't stick. And no. so one of the things that they do that's actually made it work better is you add stem cells to your fat graft, like you super concentrate the stem cells in that fat when you before you put it in there, and that is help helps the fat graft stay longer, so that you're having better results with that. But that's like I mean, it is. I haven't ever done that on myself, but I think it's a good tool uh, to use if you have a little extra fat. Yeah, well, and it was interesting because then I asked him. So I'm like, okay, so let's say somebody comes to you for fat transfer, and then they go and they, you know, they decide, okay, this is great. Now I've got to drop twenty pounds. And they decide they're going to get their hands on a GLP-1 agonist, for example, and they drop 20 pounds. I'm like, what happened to the fat transfer? And he started laughing and goes, yeah, that would be contraindicated. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Because, you know, it's the fat's going to go and you've just spent all this money and put all this energy into moving fat around and now it's going to disappear on you. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. That is, that's one of the problems with it, I think. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about all these fancy schmancy amazing procedures. What what about people who either don't have the money or, you know, it's not in their wheel. They they're like, "Yeah, I don't want to do that." Like, what can I do to stimulate my own stem cells or naturally? And I you know, there's definitely things pra- lifestyle things we can do. Um, but also even in terms of, you know, from a longevity perspective, there's still other ways to, or other supplements or other things we can bring into the picture that can help us to live a more vibrant, healthy life. And and we're going to leave off the basics. We're going to assume that this audience knows that you've got to be sleeping, you got to eat the right diet, you got to all that stuff. But now like next level stuff, without going to the lengths of harvesting stem cells and bringing them back or exosomes. What are some of the other things that people really should be thinking about just to, to, to kind of live longer, healthier, more vital lives? Because, you know, one thing, actually I'll interrupt myself before you, you jump in here. And, you know, if you look at all the centenarians that get interviewed these days, um, because, you know, I guess because of media and social media and whatever, we find the people that are 100 or 110 or 100 and whatever years old. And I'm pretty sure none of them really set out to live 100 years old. They just did. None of them are doing stem cells, fat transfers, exosomes, like all that stuff. And yet they made it, you know, to be centenarian. So can we maybe talk, explore a little bit, like some of the factors that are really in might be involved and maybe more important in longevity that we don't 
Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I do think the basics, I, I think that you can't hammer home that enough. You know, it's funny, whenever I do like an Instagram post about something like increasing testosterone or whatever, um, there's always people who are like, but what about the basics? Like, what could you do naturally? And I'm like, well, I just assume that you know that, like, I feel like you know that. Like, I, but, but yes, like you have, and I think that that's what, you know, the, my, my grandmother just passed away this last year and she was almost 103 and, but she was someone who was out in her garden and she was in the sun and she was making her, you know, making her own food and she would walk on the treadmill when she was 80 years old. Like, I, I do think the basics are important. I think some of the things that we don't talk about as much is the, the belonging piece. I think mm -hmm. that the belonging in, to a community um, or to have, you know, kind of having a purpose is really, really important. And we know, you know, from the Harvard study that's been going on since the depression that the, uh, you know, a sense of belonging is it's more powerful in terms of increasing your longevity than, you know, social status or even genetics when you look at all the data. So that's something that, you know, it's a little harder to like do by yourself. Like you have to have other people, right. To like have belong to a person or a group or a, a community, but that is really, really important. And I think that's not touched on quite as much as it should be. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, and then all the other, like just basic stuff, like lifestyle stuff, I think is, is obviously very important. I think the sun is also important. I'm, I'm kind of this weird person in that I'm, um, I'm really concerned with the with skin health, you know, and skin aging. And I tell people, you know, put on your mineral sunblock or your, your skin's going to age faster. But I also see that the, the sun has actually been very beneficial to get at least in small doses because we have these population studies like the Swedish study where people who didn't get sun, you know, lack of sun exposure was a risk factor for dying on par with like, you know, smoking cigarettes for 20 years um, mm -hmm. or obesity or things, you know, we know that lack of sun exposure increases your risk for multiple different types of cancer, including breast cancer and colon cancer, as well as diabetes. And, you know, like the list of things that are worsened by not getting sun occasionally is pretty large. And I think that, you know, because we've told ourselves the sun is bad, we just, people aren't going out and, you know, we're just inside more. So I think some sun exposure is important too. So can you qualify some? Because I, I remember once saying to someone and she was horrified. I said to her, look, like 20 minutes, middle of the day, no sunscreen. Like you would have thought that I told her to smoke a pack of cigarettes. She was just yeah. horrified that I would even suggest such. A, and she's like got the hat on and the sunscreen. I'm unfortunately at the other end of the scale. I was a lifeguard growing up. Like I've had a lot of sun exposure. And if you put me under the right light, you would see all those years of too much sun exposure, like, you know, the damage it's done. But and I know it's going to be different based yeah. on the individual but in um is there is there some little guidance we can give people in terms of i mean i say don't don't burn i mean yeah, yeah. don't ever burn that's number one because the, the, the burn is you know burning is dna being damaged and it may not be repaired and it's cancer risk and it's all the things i mean the sun definitely can cause harm um in the swedish study when they looked at all the population of people they found that the people who had the highest like it was like a dose response curve the people who had the highest sun exposure had the lowest overall mortality people who had the lowest you know and it, and it was like a, everywhere along the way like if you were middle of the road you had the you know kind of middle of the road um mortality so with with in that study more sun more sun was more benefits um I, you know, for me, I think it's something, it really does depend on your skin type, you know, what else you're doing, where you live, all of that. But I think, yeah, I think 20 minutes, 10, 20 minutes, if you're just, if you're looking at just vitamin D production, which is part of it, but it's not all the benefits of the sun, you know, you probably only need 10 or 20 minutes um, a day or every other day or something to get enough vitamin D, you know, to get you into that range where it's a little healthier, 40 or 50 or something. Um, mm -hmm. But there are so many other benefits from the sun that we don't really know how to quantify like the nitric oxide benefit, like the serotonin and the oxytocin and, you know, some of these other things that we don't really check um, that I think are beneficial. So, you know, for me, like I'll wear a hat and sunblock on my face and my neck because those things get sun all the time. And I don't want them to get sun, but then I'll go out with like a tank top and some shorts and just, you know, like, I feel like my body doesn't see that much sun. And so I think that it's, I, I go out until I feel like I've gotten a little bit of glow and then I'll go back inside. But I, I don't know if we know, if we know the exact amount of sun you need. Yeah. And there's also the the story about how toxic some of the sunscreens out there are, right? Like it's we've we've created this paradox for people where we tell them, you know, wear sunscreen, stay out of the sun. 
And yet a lot of the sunscreens that are on the market themselves are filled with chemicals that are ultimately carcinogenic. Yeah. And, and there's sunscreens and there's sunblocks and sunscreens yeah. are the chemicals and those are the ones you want to stay away from in general. And there's some that are probably fine, but like, I just think as a group, it's easier. The sunblocks are physically blocking the sun from your skin. And that's the zinc oxide, titanium dioxide. Um, and that's what I tell, you know, just those are super safe. They're not getting in your body. I mean, unless you're doing like a nano formulation, but just the normal ones that are just sitting on your skin, we have no reason to believe they're harming you um, and they do a good job. Right. Okay. So you were talking, so you were saying sun, the basics, the whole nine yards. And then um, in terms of, you know, promoting our own stem cell utilization or mobilization, whatever the case may be, we, you mentioned earlier that hyperbaric oxygen therapy helps to mobilize stem cells, but that too requires going and finding a chamber and hanging out in there. So are there it practices does. that people can do themselves at home that are in their life? I mean, I, I'm not, I mean, exercise and, you know, the red light therapy can be helpful. Like all of those like sort of biohacky tools, a lot of them will help with stem cells, um, keeping your stress down, sleeping, you know, I, I, we talked about those things, but that's where a lot of your repair happens at night. So you want to make sure you're sleeping. Um, and then there are some different supplements that I think could be helpful as well. I think that anything, you know, any of the nitric oxide boosters where you're increasing nitric oxide, you're going to have improved stem cell activity. Um, any, there's some other things like, like calcium alpha ketoglutarate, probably in, it, it, we know it in study in tissue studies, it, it has some stem cell activity, um, uh, spermidine, any of the NAD precursors, like, so any, you know, some of these, these, the supplements that are considered these like longevity ingredients will work on the stem cell pathway, as well as, you know, the mitochondrial health and the telomeres and all the other parts of, uh, the other hallmarks of aging, the things that are causing us to age, they'll work on multiple of those. What about fasting? Does fasting yeah. bump up, help your body to like, yeah. you know, it's funny, like, and it's kind of like defined fasting because sometimes I feel some of the attributes, some of the benefits we, we attribute to fasting, you got to fast a long time. Like, you yeah. not like to really get the autophagy to really get those really more like the more advanced benefits of fasting, you kind of got to get in like three days, four days in before you see that stat. Yeah. There's some studies on like, like looking at like the um, GI tract, the stem cells in the GI tract that I think it was two days. It's been a little while since I looked, but I think it was like two day fast. What well, you're increasing your stem cell, you know, turnover in that area. Um, yeah. And I think that there, I don't know enough about the fasting literature. I know that it talks, there's talk, there's talk about stem cell, you know, improvements and, and auto, autophagy and all of those things. But the problem is we don't really have a way to measure that. Like that's the problem that, you know, to me, fasting is one of those things where like, how do we know how much good it's doing you or not doing you um, in terms of like, we don't have a test that we, I can give you before and after, or, you know, like, I don't have a way to look at that that modality and see how much it's helping you or not helping you. So um, I don't know for sure, but there is some evidence that maybe it helps with stem cells. I've seen some of those studies. Yeah, no. And I feel there's a lot of, there's a lot of inference, you know, like people are grabbing facts from different studies on different things in different ways and just yeah. saying, Oh, it does this. And yeah. yeah. And I think you have to be careful too, with there's so much like mechanistic data out there. Like, like someone will take a study that shows like, for instance, you've got, you know, something that shows that kale has oxalates and that oxalates do this, you know, one thing, this, this chemical reaction that causes this one type of harm in this path, this one biochemical pathway. And then they'll take that and extrapolate it and say, well, because this does this pathway, that's this bad, this, this, you know, you shouldn't eat kale because it's going to be harmful, but you don't, but, the, but you don't look at the actual, you know, the person and there, you know, we don't have studies that show us that kale is harmful. Like there aren't studies that show us that. And so it's things like that. I think that the same kind of thing happens with some of the other, like the fasting data or even the stem cell data. Like they just take little tiny, you know, little tiny pathways and mechanisms and they say, well, it does this one thing, therefore it's yeah. going to be helpful for all of this, or it's going to cause harm for all, for all of this. But like, we're way more complicated than that. I agree. I think it's this reductionist and it's, it's both a reductionist attitude and this, this desire to create a bite-sized piece of information that people can hang on to. Right. I think the kale, the story of kale is a sad story in the biohacking community. <laughs> Because it's such a sad story. It's just, it, yeah. It went from the darling of, of food to becoming like so maligned. And I think part of it also is people just started eating kale all the time. 
right? Like they put kale in their smoothies and eating it raw and eating it this and eating it that. And, and at the end of the day, like, it's just a food guys. And it's, and it's, and if it doesn't, I mean, admittedly, it's tough to digest when it's raw. So you might have to, you know, cook it and do things to it so that it's, you know, it's less food for someone with multiple stomachs and more appropriate for someone with one stomach. But, but, it's, but it's not, it's been demonized in particular kale. I don't know. It's just become the, the scapegoat of the nutrition world in certain circles. It's very sad. Yeah. It's so I think that I think it's just I think it's easy, uh, especially now that we live in this world where and I'm, you know, I'm guilty too. Like you're on, you're trying to create a 30 second video that it gets you gets eyeballs and gets likes and gets shares and gets all these things. And you know, how do you do that when the topics are very complicated and and it's not nothing as very few things are as simple as 30 seconds. Um, but we that's kind of what we're, you know, we're reducing it to. So I think it's it's difficult, but I it's, we have to be careful as as consumers not to get sucked into that. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I think that that is that's very good advice. Okay, so people might be wondering, there's these three words on your <laughs> top of your screen, hop to it. And they're like, what does that mean? Why is that there? I mean, is that her motto? Um, <laughs> kind of is my motto. It kind of could be. Yeah, kind exactly. Of, yeah, kind of my motto. Um, this is my company, Hop, which is a supplement company, and our the, the tagline is Hop to it. And it's also just kind of like my motto. Like it's kind of like a just do it, hop to it. Like just get out there and. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but it, the HOP stands for Human Optimization Project, and it's it's a longevity focused um, supplement company that that I created um, about a year ago to try to make some of this easier for people who don't want to do all the research themselves um, to still kind of take the things that I think are the most beneficial. Yeah, and so so what you've done, I mean, you've done a really nice job with this because what you've done is, like you said, you've looked at all the research. And you've 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 curated. I think that's the right, the best word, way to put it is you've curated a, a supplement stack that is most evidence based that most people can take, and made it really simple. Because I think that certainly I, when I talk to a lot of people who either are my clients or want to be my clients, a lot of people come to me and they go, "Nat, I've got four pantry cupboards filled with supplements. I don't." I mean, I moved house last year. I had five pieces. I mean, it was nuts. They were everywhere. They're still everywhere. They're still getting unpacked. Um, and and they're like, can you help me? Like, I, I don't know what to take anymore. And I don't know. And I do think, you know, it's funny because there's people in our community who brag about taking 180 or 200 capsules a day. And in my heart of hearts, quite apart from the fact that I don't have... I don't think I have the discipline to take that many pills in a day, nor do I have the desire. I worry that there's a point of diminishing returns. Like I, I'm concerned that again, with those supplements, as much as we've done it with, with some of the, the information is we're taking like these little individual bits. And when you take 180 individual bits and throw them together, like nobody knows what's going to happen here. <laughs> like it's, it's, right. Yeah, it's, giant it's expensive. Giant. Like if you think about the, so that's kind of why. So basically, the wet hop is it's like a little packet, and in the packet is five pills that are nineteen ingredients total. So nineteen ingredients packaged into five pills, and it's a formula that I, that I created with my team, and I chose ingredients at the you know the right dose for to be efficacious for most people, but not dangerous. So we're trying to find that like middle ground, right? And I I do agree that a lot of people, you know, not everyone is going to have, take the same same supplements or benefit from the same things, but we chose ingredients that are we think most people could benefit from. Um, and it's a longevity but, screen, right? Like your 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 filter is from a longevity perspective. You're not trying to meet people's basic needs. They're going to have to do that somewhere else. Yes. This is this is a longevity formula as it were. Yeah, it's things that you're not going to get in high enough doses in food or at all. Like so some things are just not even in food, um, and that you're, you know, that that have been shown in some studies to have, you know, potential longevity or geroprotective benefits. Um, so, so it's, you know, it's some of the it's some of the things that you we talked about earlier, like the NAD precursors, like NR, spermidine, which I know you're a fan of, um, which I think has lots of great lots of great science and kind of good potential. Um, it's some like you know hyaluronic acid, which is great for your skin, berberine, which is 
is fantastic for you know metabolism um, and sugar and all that. And then we have a few things like vitamin D and B vitamins that just people don't tend to get enough of. But for the most part, it's things that you're that you probably haven't heard of. <laughs> a lot of them that your audience has, but like the regular person probably hasn't heard of a lot of these ingredients. But they're things that are sort of high level longevity promoters, or at least we think they are. Yeah. And so you've been, you've been, and the cool thing, quite apart from the packaging being awesome and having made it so easy, you take out a pouch, open it up, five capsules down the hatch and you're done. Um, there's, there's always cool facts on each little pouch. I, I like, I just, I love the way you guys have put it together. Like love, everything about this product is just fun. And it, frankly, it reflects you <laughs> to be oh, honest. <laughs> I felt like supplements were such a, like, I just want them to, I just wanted them to be fun. And especially for women, like we're not necessarily just for women, but we really, we speak to women a lot. I think, because I don't, I think women have gotten lost a little bit in like the longevity um, biohacker world. I mean, certainly your audience is, has, has, has you, which is amazing, but I think a lot of women just really are lost in this kind of male dominated world. And we wanted to have um, messages that made it like much more fun and accessible. And like, you don't have to go out and like learn, like, it's just, you can, you can take what you want from it, make it easy. It's on the go, like take it with you on your backpacking trip or your, you know, mountain biking trip or whatever, um, live your life. And we'll be there with you versus like having to do all this extra work. So that's kind of the idea. Yeah, no, I love that. And I heard you say once that, you know, as the science evolves, your plan is that you will reassess what's in that pouch. And, you know, which I think, to put it out there that this is not a fixed formula, that this is a, we're learning as we're like acknowledging that, you know what, we're, we're learning as we go in human health, human longevity, human vitality, and things are always changing. And, and so this formula will evolve as our knowledge moves yeah. along with it. I mean, I want to be able to just take this. I mean, I, I have a few other things I take as well, but I want to just be able to take this one pack in general. Yeah, that's my to go, go to. So if I find out that there's things that are not beneficial or there's new ingredients that I think should be in there, then, you know, we, we about every six months, we're looking to see, should we be adding this? Should we, you know, should we not? And we'll have other products as well. But I do think it's important that that we evolve as a science because none of this is none of this is stay, standing still. Yeah, a hundred percent. And so, and this is appropriate for boys and girls. Yes, it is. Yes, it's appropriate for everyone. Um, it has they're, they're pretty pink packages, but you know, a lot of our customers are men, and they don't seem to mind. So, <laughs> there's lots of different colors. <laughs> there's lots of different colors, but it is it is a longevity stack. So, is there an age that you think people, you know, is it more age appropriate for let's say the thirty five plus crowd, or is it? Yeah. You can certainly start it earlier, but I think about 35 is probably more appropriate as you're starting to like think about, you know, the, the things that are causing aging that you want to start, you know, your mitochondria aren't functioning as well. Your telomeres are shortening. You have more inflammation. You're, you know, like this, these 12 now hallmarks of aging, um, you start to really become more aware of them in your thirties. And then certainly it just kind of gets worse. So I think starting to address them, you know, in that time frame makes sense. Right. And maybe it'll keep you more fit so that when you do decide to do stem cells or exosomes, the the terrain is in a better place to receive yes. um, the extra love from those kinds of therapies. So, all right, Amy. So, oh, you know, there was one other thing we were going to talk about. We we're going to talk about, okay, bonus topic, guys, just before we go. <laughs> Because I, this is this is the classic saying goodbye and going. Oh no, wait, one more thing. Um, <laughs> we were going to talk very briefly about ovarian rejuvenation using stem cells. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and just because I think you came across some really interesting literature on this, and and it's an interesting topic, right? Because and I actually talked, to, interviewed somebody else today who went through early men menopause. I think at the age she was in her late thirties. Um, and I don't know if ovarian aging would have been central to that or not, but, you know, so this idea that our ovaries age and that there's some research going on right now that's looking at applying stem cells to those ovaries to reverse their age. Is that 
Yes. I got that yeah, right. There is research. And there's actually case reports, like human case reports and small observational studies. And again, I, so I just, I don't inject stem cells into ovaries just so you know, but yeah. I think it's interesting and I think it's, it's worth talking about ovarian aging and I won't talk for very long, but because we know that women who go into premature menopause, their, their mortality rate is increased. You know, if you're pretty much, if you have, if you have premature ovarian uh, failure, then you have about a 30% increased mortality rate um, compared to someone who goes into menopause at the normal time. And so that, again, it's the loss of hormones. So when you can't make the hormones, um, especially estrogen, then you are at increased risk of all these things. So there is finally, there, there's research being done that's saying, hey, what? If, how can we stop these ovaries from aging so quickly. Um, and so the stem cell injections into the ovaries is one avenue and they've, they have seen some improvements in that. Um, there's also some, um, supplements like some of the ones we talked about actually like um like quercetin melatonin um as well as some of the other like mitochondrial boosters like coq10 and things like that like looking at how can we slow the aging that way and then there are some medications like rapamycin is the main one that's being looked at and um, there's a study going on at columbia right now but that's a great we didn't talk about like rapamycin is an amazing potential longevity uh, prescription medication that I'm a big fan of. And there's a study looking at, can we give this to women to help preserve ovarian function for longer? And so that's going to be interesting to see those results. Really? And so they would just take, the idea is that one would just use rapamycin, which is sirolimus, right? Is that the, yeah, so right. they, they would use rapamycin mm -hmm. systemically and somehow the ovaries would be the beneficiaries um, yeah. The mouse study, they, they, they took them, I think it was daily for like 10 weeks in younger mice. And what happens with rapamycin is it basically, it's a, it's a kind of an anti-growth in this cap capacity. So it kind of, it may even shut down the production, you know, variant, you know, production during that time, but then it kind of reserves those, those follicles that make the, that make the eggs. And so later when they looked at these mice, when they were older, the ones who'd gotten rapamycin had like twice as many follicles as the ones that hadn't. And so it's the idea of like, can we give you something that is like, it's almost like telling your body that you're starving or that you're like, you're not in a place to reproduce. So like, you know, hoard your eggs, like don't, don't just give them out. Um, and so it, it's a good, it's a question we're not quite sure about, but I think rapamycin is the leading contender and like, can we potentially uh, delay uh, menopause and delay ovarian aging? Wow. So this is in premenopausal women, pre yeah, premenopausal yeah, women. Because once you, once you have no eggs, so once you're about like five years or so into menopause, you're out of eggs, like they're gone. Right. And so yeah. that's, that's not, you really want to get to that, that population before. So, um, and what, what, what you may not know is that, you know, every month, certainly you lose one egg during ovulation, but you're, you're actually losing hundreds of, of follicles, the, the things that make the eggs hundreds of them go through either apoptosis or autophagy, or they just kind of become senescent cells. Like all the words, you know, from longevity, the longevity world that happens to your follicles too. And so is there a way to prevent all those extra follicles from just like going and dying and becoming like, you know, useless? Um, could we, because if we could do that, then you'd have follicles, you know, for potentially years later and you'd have menopause onset much later. Interesting. And so the idea of using rapamycin for the older population, because that's by prescription. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and because that's because it's a very it's a very certainly in the longevity community, in the community that's interested in longevity. Yeah. It's very it's becoming a bit of a trend right now. There's quite yeah. a lot of people who have convinced their doctors to give them prescriptions one way or another. Um the benefits, if you're not trying to rejuvenate your ovaries, um, seem to be, but but there's this whole dialogue because it seems to shut off mTOR, which is what allows us to build muscle. And so people, and, and I just read a study the other day that said, well, it seems to be a three day effect. So, you know, we want to maintain muscle because we want to, eat, we don't want to end up like a noodle by the time we're old with no muscle. Right. But at the same time, if we're using something like rapamycin that seems to be shutting down mTOR as one of its mechanisms of action to slow down aging, we want it, we kind of need to balance those two opposing 
Yeah. And, you know, the truth is we don't know the best way to to, to actually dose rapamycin um, for longevity purpose. I've been on rapamycin for four years. I just take it once a week. Some people take it once every two weeks. You know, the dose is pretty variable, but um, the animal research on rapamycin is very strong. Every single animal species that's been tested on from worms to monkeys and dog, you know, dogs that got kind of cut off, cut off, but like every other animal species um, has shown actual lifespan lengthening with rapamycin, health span also, but lifespan. And there are very few things increase lifespan in species, let alone all the species that's been tested in. So that's why people are so excited about it. Pretty exciting. Okay, so for our second goodbye. Um, <laughs> I'm never leaving. I'm never no, leaving. I'm just all that, coming up with topics. Like, I mean, <laughs> We're at the well of we were, we're at the infinite well of Dr. Amy Killen at this point. So <laughs> let's just keep bringing up more amazing stuff. I, let's just let's just say that we're going to do this again. We'll do it again. <laughs> and let's tell people where to find you. And if they're interested, where to find Hotbox. And we'll have a link in the show notes. Um, and yeah, we'll we'll do all the things in the show notes. But why don't you tell people where they can find you? And I, I'm telling you guys, you've got to follow her on Instagram. You just <laughs> So I'm Dr. Amy B. Killen on Instagram, like Dr. Amy B. Killen, like that. Um, but <laughs> and then, sorry, I'm getting all red over here. Um, and then I have my, my main website is dramykillen.com. I, that kind of links you to several other things if you need question, you know, questions about clinics and stuff. And then Hopbox is H-O-P box, hopbox.life. And that is our main, our main website for that. Amazing. Dr. Amy B. Killen, thank you so much for today. This has been so fun, so amazing, and I'm looking forward to doing it again. Thank you. Bye, everyone.